Hi there, and welcome to Enterprise Software Innovators, a show where top technology executives share how they innovate at scale. In each episode, enterprise CIOs share how they've applied exciting new technologies and what they've learned along the way. I'm Sam Motamidi, a general partner at Greylock Partners. And I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. Today on the show, we're bringing you a conversation with Akash Karana, CIO at Wesco International. With over 18,000 employees and $20 billion of revenue, Wesco provides B2B electrical, communications, and maintenance service to customers around the world. If your office building uses electricity and internet, chances are Wesco has helped your company digitally connect to the world. In this conversation, Akash shares his perspective on digital transformation, the importance of partisan data, and how Wesco is deploying AI to optimize their operations. Well, Akash, maybe before we dive in, just want to say thank you for joining us today. Yeah, great. No, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Awesome. Yeah. Akash, great to have you on. Excited to kick off. Could you start by giving our audience a bit of background on Wesco and your role there as the CIO? Yeah, sure. Wesco is a B2B industrial distribution company. We uh, over uh, 20 billion in revenue. We uh, rank Fortune 200, very global in nature. We operate in over 50 plus countries. We have a team size of 19,000 employees across the globe. And we work primarily in the electrical and electronics space. We work in data communication and security solutions sector. And finally, the utilities and uh, broadband sector. And we take pride in saying that uh, as an organization, we uh, help power and connect the global people across different sectors, different industries, different geographic locations. And the services that we provide really make an impact on on our day-to-day quality of life. Yeah, it's super interesting. A lot of the fabric of like what we all do is actually built on top of the services that you provide, which is part of why we've been so excited out of this conversation. Yeah. Can you maybe share some of the ways that people who might be listening to this podcast in the future may kind of interact or kind of like experience some of the service or products provide, but maybe ways they don't know, right? Because I imagine your business affects probably a lot of people, right, indirectly. And they may not realize a lot of the things they do are because of you know the work you guys are doing behind the scenes. So if you think about uh, utilities as a sector, we are uh, one of the largest utility MRO and services and solution provider, right? So Most of the utility providers in North America, we are their uh, preferred choice of uh, service providers, and we bring their capabilities, whether it's on the generation transmission side, we bring that to the households. We are very actively involved in taking broadband services across Americas and beyond. There are many rural areas within Americas where uh, the connectivity, which we all take for granted, is, is not there. And we work with whether it's public sector, private sector, local communities to put in the infrastructure that enables uh, broadband and in some cases, fiber services. So we are the people who are standing up the poles. We are the people who are laying the wire. We are the people who are taking the service to the market. Well, I appreciate you sharing and just want to help kind of ground it for the audience because probably there's some listener out there, right, that wouldn't be in that building without work from um, Wesco, right? Or maybe getting power to their computer or internet to download the podcast. Absolutely. I mean, so it's essentially all the way from macro infrastructure to very specific building or a site, you know, down to really how you are leveraging the technology to do your day-to-day job, right? I mean, Wesco is literally embedded in that entire value chain. Yeah, and actually that point is exactly why Sam and I originally started this podcast is we knew that there's big organization enterprise out there that were doing incredible innovation and in helping bring new experiences, right? And uh, new capabilities for civilization. And people don't fully realize like all the stuff that has to happen to go uh, make that you know, come true. So I'm um, excited to share more. The specific topic that we've talked a lot about on the show is digital transformation. And that kind of means different things, right? To different folks we speak with. Love to hear how would you define that? And in the context of your business, I'd love to just hear about how you're using technology to kind of transform how you work and create better, probably employee, customer, and partner experiences. First of all, it's a massive agenda. Right? So it's something that touches everyone from an enterprise perspective, everyone who's involved in the entire value chain. The way I define it is in terms of uh, leveraging digital to create new value 
channels for the organization, whether it's through new products, new services, new solutions, new ways of going to market, new ways of engaging with customers, new ways of uh, doing business with our uh, partner ecosystem, new ways of tapping into innovation capability of the organization. Uh, To me, that literally is a digital transformation. Traditionally, in a B2B industrial, we would do pick pack ship, which is very transactional. We would do value added services, value added engineering. This is where the differentiation would come in. And we will leverage hundreds, if not thousands of business models to take those capabilities to our customers and to end markets. Now, as you think about the digital transformation, it's making pick pack ship, the transactional components much more efficient. It's allowing us to have a much broader portfolio of doing value added services, value added engineering. And it's allowing us to bring in the network effect on the business models, which like, you know, we are a very innovative company. That's what we take uh, pride in, but it's now bringing the scale to those business models and allowing us to really build on that foundation of innovation that we have in our company. And digital technologies are helping us to do that. When we think about our partners, there's, of course, a component of uh, how we share industry insights with our supplier, how we share our forecasts, our demand with our uh, suppliers. But providing that in a way that allows for our supplier partners to internalize and uh, really leverage the technology depth that we have to uh, create new channels, create new ways of taking their products and services to the market. Right. So those are the three key macro elements that we think about as we talk about digital transformation. It sounds like there's a lot of stuff to do and lots of impact. No small feats there. It's all fun stuff, right? Yeah. This uh, portfolio and the digital transformation really is changing the way, not only just the industry that we are in, but uh, the industries that we work with and the industries that we serve are changing as well. Uh, I imagine part of the challenge, right, is like also technology is changing really quickly, right? And so... What people thought was possible 10 years ago, we could probably do more today than you know, we originally thought. And maybe just to help us visualize like a really concrete example, is there some kind of result of kind of some of the digital transformation you've done today that you feel really proud about? Where if you went back in time 10 years ago, right, to maybe your former self, you're like, hey, in 2022, we're going to be able to use technology to achieve this thing. It's really going to transform how we work. And maybe your former self or maybe other people on the team 10 years ago would have been like, that sounds like science fiction, Akash. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I, you know, <laughs> is there an example there, right, yeah. where you know you feel like, yeah. hey, we've really transformed things in ways that were probably a little bit unexpected? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a couple examples. One is internal in our sales and commercial organization. Rather than our team members going and finding ways to respond to commercial opportunities, we are bringing those opportunities using data, using technology, and prescribing those opportunities to our sales organization. So imagine like you know, coming in and fetching for information versus being presented information in a way that you can go execute towards, right? The speed to market, the speed to value capture is exponentially increased, right? So that's one internal example. External is when we talk to our uh, customers, we no longer talk about just the core transactional capabilities that we provide. But we are going in and we are having discussions about, let's understand your value chain. Let's understand those pain points and allow us to bring those capabilities that stitch the information across various subsystems that a customer might have in their landscape. Right? I mean, customers don't limit themselves to one technology. But our company, Vesco, can stitch that technology and take that burden away from the customers and really allow them to focus on what makes a difference in their customer base and their offerings. Yeah, Akash, I was thinking that was really interesting. I mean, I think if you take the extension of these trends you're talking about and data in particular, one area that Evan and I are highly interested in is once I have my data in a place where it's usable, how do I leverage AI and ML to unlock business value on top of that data? And that's a theme lots of folks in industry talk about. But what we find is like, there's not a lot of discussion around the actual concrete impact AI has in companies like Wesco. And so when you think about AI and ML, is there an example that comes to mind of an initiative you've driven recently? And maybe talk through that example, starting with the problem you were trying to solve and 
the role AI and ML played in solving it. One area that we have seen significant improvements is product recommendation. We have massive data from our end-to-end value chain. And as we respond to a commercial proposal, it's all about you know, how do we go to the product set that is available, a product set that a sales rep is familiar with, and that was the past, right? So I mean, it's, it's very, very linear in terms of responses. And that's what we kind of innovated towards using the AI technology. We are able to now provide not only one linear option to our sales representatives, but we are able to provide multiple recommendations with uh, different profiles, different availability metrics, which uh, allow much better uh, capability for our sales organization to deliver to our demands, customer commitments. And now we are starting to talk about the generative AI, which is recently it has taken a lot of press. This is something that we have been working on for quite some time and bringing those capabilities to stitch together the information and uh, provide that insight in a more prescribed manner to both internal and the external stakeholders. There's a lot there I want to double click on, but I want to start with the last point you made around generative AI. I'm sure a lot of listeners in our podcast have used ChatGPT or some of the image generation models to create images. And I think certainly when I first used these tools, you get a sense of magic. You're like, wow, I, I didn't know computers could do this. And then the question is, how do you connect that magic to like changing our lives? And again, like Wesco has such an interesting role here being the foundation to so much of all of our day-to-day lives. Can you expand on the generative AI and like either for Wesco specifically or more generally, like help us imagine a couple of real kind of enterprise use cases for generative AI? Let's assume that you have a robust foundation of data with the right quality, right governance and right structures in place. Now, that's where generative AI, in conjunction with the already existing AI models in the organization, can help in various functions, whether it's finance, whether it's HR from a human capital management, really understanding the workforce planning, workforce modeling. It can help from a risk assessment perspective across the organization. It can help with from a sales and commercial side, identifying and connecting the dots uh, as you think about opportunities, it can help with the operational components from supply and demand perspective. So various use cases that become reality with a technology like this. But I do want to caution that it's not magic. It takes that base principles and discipline around data. It takes a level of maturity from core data science perspective. It takes some level of maturity in leveraging analytics. And then we're just scratching the surface in this area. I think there's a lot of skepticism, right? I think in kind of enterprise technology executives about what is the real value of AI? I think we all agree that there's some gap between the promise of AI versus the actual results we're getting today. And the results will kind of improve over time. And there's work to do. As you said, we're in kind of the early stages there. But, you know, people have different levels of conviction about where those areas will kind of accrue the most value. If we fast forward to like 10 years from now, what are some things that you think that these types of new technologies will enable for your customers right, in terms of how it changes their experience working with you that maybe kind of the cynic CIO might think is kind of fantasy? As I think about Vesco, we are becoming more and more of a technology-enabled company. AI is uh, at the center of uh, our approach, our strategy. We think of AI in terms of enhancing the services, the solutions that we provide to our customers. We see AI helping in internal operations, making it much more efficient, elevating our employee base to no longer be stuck in just a mundane task, but really focus on what moves the needle, what drives value. And also in each and every transaction that we have with our supplier partners, we believe AI really enhancing the quality of that interaction and, and in many ways, right? And just uh, in terms of speed, in terms of accuracy, in terms of uh, efficiency, that's where we see AI is headed. We have something we call as AI factory and every business model, every opportunity that we think of, we take a lens of what can AI do in this area? I mean, you really need to make it part of your operating model so that it becomes the way you operate, the way you think about technology, the way you think about providing services and solutions. 
I appreciate you sharing. I know we got limited time. I'm going to switch over us into the lightning round. So we had kind of maybe like a handful of questions and kind of looking for like the one tweet version, right? Sometimes maybe it's two tweets, right? But looking for kind of the soundbite version. So Sam, let me turn it over to you to tee up our first lightning round question. Akash, maybe let's start with talking about the role of a CIO. How should companies measure the success of a CIO? Yeah, I think there are two elements. One is security, how CIOs are uh, keeping the company secured from cyber and all the ever-evolving threats. The second is the bottom line impact, which is, uh, you know, CIOs are really good at that. That's something that they have uh, controlled and made an impact to for many years. And the third one is the commercial impact. Right. I mean, what new opportunities, revenue impact, margin impact that a CIO is able to bring. That makes sense. I like that framework. Maybe kind of the almost the opposite of that question. There's probably people that are stepping into CIO role for the first time. Are there any kind of common mistakes that you see up and coming you know, technology leaders like overlook or maybe kind of fumble on? Yeah, I think uh, many times as a technologist, you come in into an organization and you inherit you know, a lot of legacy, a lot of complexities, a lot of you know, investments that have been done in the past, successful or, or failed initiatives. It's just a tendency that uh, you kind of get comfortable with that complexity. You start to learn how to manage that complexity and uh, get to the next day. My suggestion is don't accept that complexity. Don't accept that legacy. And you are brought in into the organization to make a change. If company wanted to do more of the same, they would have, I like, you know, just left the IT or the digital organization the way it was operating. They are looking for the change. It's important that you remind yourself on a daily basis that don't get comfortable with it and find ways to bring about that change. That makes sense. Maybe one more question around CIO's responsibility, which is which part of a CIO's role do you think is most underestimated in its importance? I think it's the cybersecurity. I think it's an area which is evolving at a a very rapid pace, uh, especially over the last few years. The evolution is exponential. The CIO's responsibility, of course, in partnership with the chief information security officers to make sure that the company is uh, safe and secure and compliant. Companies are starting to realize the importance of that and what it can mean in terms of disruption to the business operations. But it's an area which is still in its early stages of really elevating the discussion, giving the CIOs and the CISOs what needs to be done at the enterprise level to kind of be safe and secure around this. Akash, you got an amazing bookshelf behind you, right? If I see a book written by one of Sam's partners, or Reed, Reed Hoffman, um, but love to hear if there's a recent book that you've read that's had a big impact on you. Love to hear if so, why? I... I really enjoyed a book called uh, Think Again by Adam Grant. Uh, I think it provides kind of a very interesting perspective on how you think about organizational dynamics and different roles people play and uh, lean towards. Another one that I really enjoyed was focused on innovation. That uh, was Creative Construction by uh, Gary Pisano. He has a way of uh, synthesizing the literature around innovation, and there is a lot of it over the last four to five decades. And a lot has been published, and he just finds a way to synthesize it in a way that it's very practical and you can do something about it rather than getting uh, overwhelmed by different processes, frameworks, ways to engage in the innovation cycles. So and those are the two books that kind of stand out for me, and I really enjoyed them leading through, uh, I think, during the last holidays. That was my reading. <laughs> Good choices. Akash, maybe to close, staying on the personal theme, we've talked about a number of technology trends today. What's a new technology that's emerging or going to emerge over the next several years that you're personally most excited about? I think AI, ML, deep learning, I think those, uh, I just combine those in one segment, maybe an umbrella of data science, right? I think that's an area which... uh, I still think that there is it's in very early stages. I believe as companies become more focused on the foundational components, getting the data structures, data domains right, I think the power of uh, data science will really unleash tremendous value for enterprises. So I'm really excited about that. And again, generative AI, open AI is just one step 
forward in that direction. Well, Akash, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Really excited to see you and looking forward to chatting again soon. Yeah, it was great chatting with you both. Thanks a lot, Akash. Thank you. That was Akash Karana, CIO of Wesco International. Thanks for listening to the Enterprise Software Innovators Podcast. I'm Sam Motamity, a general partner at Greylock Partners. And I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. Please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find more great lessons from technology leaders and other enterprise software experts at enterprisesoftware.blog. This show is produced by Luke Reiser and Josh Meir. See you next time.